change is real, it's underway, and it's already hurting us here and now. But the good news, as you all also know, is that a clean energy revolution is going on right now even as we speak. Wind and solar are cheaper and better and safer than, renewable, than fossil fuels, and they're available here and they're available now. And that's a story that we need to tell the American people because many people don't know that. But, and here's the third part, the second bad news, the fossil fuel industry is standing in the way of that clean energy revolution. For more than 30 years now, the fossil fuel industry has promoted confusion about climate change, confusion about the science, and blocked our path to a clean energy future. Now, I'm a historian, but I'm not just interested in the past. I'm also interested in the present and the future. And it's the continued obstruction by the fossil fuel industry that motivates me, even today, to continue to work on this issue and to continue to try to understand and explain and expose how the fossil fuel industry has misled the American people about climate change and about energy. And the reason for this is because until we fully recognize and come to grips with the role that they have played, they will continue to obstruct progress and we won't get the clean energy future that we deserve. So the question that my postdoc Jeffrey and I posed a couple of years ago was, have the communications about climate change by ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel companies misled customers, consumers, shareholders, and the general public? Spoiler alert, the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> and I think all of you probably suspected that, but what we wanted to do was to show it to explain it and to make it convincing and possibly, if necessary, to make it hold up in a court of law. So, I have, thank you. So I have a lot of detailed documents. Again, some of the pictures show that. Um, I am going to share this with the organizers, so ultimately they'll get it put up on the website. So if you're interested in the details, they will be available. Um, and as a historian and a scientist, I believe in evidence, so everything I say is backed up by documentary evidence, and I like to show people my evidence. Today I can't show you, so I'll have to tell, but you will be able to look at it if you're interested afterwards. So the first slide is a kind of arrow, and it shows a timeline of climate denial. And this is what Jeffrey and I have done. We have constructed a timeline of climate change denial, and it's centered around one essential fact, so if you remember nothing else from today, please remember this. The fossil fuel industry has known about the threat of climate change for a long, long time. In fact, longer than most of us have been around, more than 60 years. We, uh, we could start our story in a number of different places, but a convenient year is 1954, because that is the first year that the American Petroleum Institute published a report that alerted its members so fossil fuel companies, oil and gas, that burning fossil fuels was increasing atmospheric CO2. They already knew this in 1954, and how did they know it? An actually fairly technical report about carbon isotopes in the atmosphere. So, how many of you have heard of carbon-14? Good, so you know that it can be used to date, it's radioactive, and you can use it for dating things like pottery shards from uh, archaeological sites or human remains. How many of you have heard of carbon-13? A few, but not as many. So carbon-13 is a rare isotope of carbon, of carbon, but it's very, very important because you can use the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 to tell where carbon has come from. And carbon that comes from burning fossil fuels has a different isotope ratio than carbon that comes from volcanoes or other sources. And in 1954, the American Petroleum Institute wrote a report on carbon isotopes that said that the carbon isotope composition in the atmosphere was changing in a way that showed that fossil fuels were changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. In 1954, and I know this is a pretty grown up crowd, but that's still before a lot of us were born. They also, yeah, well I know some of you were, but you know, I know it's before I was born, so. Yeah, okay. okay. So, three years later, in 1957, Humble Oil wrote a report on the same issue. Humble Oil was one of the uh, members of Standard Oil that ultimately became Exxon. 
And they published a graph in which they showed that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was already increasing compared to the pre-industrial level, which they already knew was about 280 to 290 parts per million. That's in 1957. That's still before I'm born. In 1959, now we're getting around when I was born, um, the father of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller. How many of you have heard of him? Yeah, nearly everybody over 50. OK, so Edward Teller gave a lecture at the American Petroleum Institute in which he warned about the greenhouse effect. He used the words greenhouse effect. He talked about global warming. And he said that the greenhouse effect from burning fossil fuels could cause global warming. And that would lead to sea level rise that could drown New York. 10 years later, 1968, the American Petroleum Institute commissioned a set of reports that warned about potentially severe climate change. One of these re reports invoked the work of Roger Revelle. Now, Revelle is a hero to me because he was one of the founders of the University of California, where I taught for many years. And he was, among other many things that he did, he taught a young Al Gore when Al Gore was an undergraduate at Harvard, where I teach now. So Ravel's a very, very important figure, both scientifically and politically, because already in the 50s and 60s, he was publishing scientific papers on climate change. And he was also teaching students, bright young students like young Al Gore Jr., about this issue. And in 1968, the Petroleum Institute quotes Roger Ravel saying, that mankind is performing a great geophysical experiment, which is going to change the chemistry of the atmosphere and change the climate of this planet. And again in 1977, Exxon warned its uh, executives about potentially severe climate effects from global warming. And then we get to 1978, where an Exxon executive actually requests that the company put together a credible scientific team because they said that we need to have good science in order to make the key business decisions that will affect the future of this company. And at this point, they quoted from a scientific paper that had been co-authored by some of their own scientists. So this is scientists working for ExxonMobil in which they wrote, we accept at this point that a surface temperature rise of on the order of two degrees, two to three degrees for a doubling of CO2 is essentially correct. 1978, accepting that the scientific evidence, what scientists were saying, was essentially correct. In hindsight, one former ExxonMobil scientist put it this way. He said, quote, by the late 1970s, global warming was no longer speculative. The issue was not, were we going to have a problem? The issue was simply how soon and how fast and how bad was it going to be? So that was in 1978. And at this point, ExxonMobil, well, it wasn't ExxonMobil yet. It was Exxon faced a fork in the road. Do they re-examine their business model? Do they take seriously what their own scientists, as well as other scientists like Roger Revelle were saying, and think about maybe changing their business model, maybe investing in renewable energies, maybe becoming serious about the possibility of carbon capture, or do they double down on business as usual, continue to invest in oil and gas, and deny the scientific evidence of the problem? Well, I think you know the answer to that question. They took the path of denial. Now, a couple of years ago, as some of you also know, some of this began to become exposed. The Los Angeles Times, Inside Climate News, and the Columbia School of Journalism published a series of investigative reports specifically on this question about what Exxon knew about climate change back in the 70s. And if you read those articles, you know that many of the things that I've just said uh, were published in those reports. When that happened, ExxonMobil once again took the offensive. And on their website, they published uh, a response in which they said, we categorically reject allegations that ExxonMobil suppressed climate change research contained in media reports that are inaccurate descriptions of ExxonMobil's history. Now, of course, this was a classic ExxonMobil strategy to misrepresent what their opponents were saying. So the Los Angeles Times had never said that ExxonMobil suppressed climate research. Quite the contrary. They had said that they had done climate research and that this research had told their executives that climate change was a real threat. But 
ExxonMobil didn't want to admit that. They mischaracterized what the accusation was, and then they said, and they put this on their website in big letters, when it comes to climate change, read the documents. And they posted on their website a link to a set of documents related to this issue. Well, I'm a historian of science. What I do for a living is read documents. <laughs> so this was kind of like a red flag in front of a bull. And when my postdoc showed me this, I looked at him and I said, are you kidding me? They actually said that? Uh, and they did, and so we did. We read the documents. We read everything that ExxonMobil put on their website that they claimed exonerated them, that they claimed refuted the Los Angeles Times, and in addition, we found about a thousand more documents that were also pertinent to this question. And we read them all. My poor postdoc, he's only 30 years old, he's already got bad eyes, you know. Um, took us, we, we thought at first, when they said read the documents, the initial thing they put up had about 50 documents. We thought, oh, we'll knock this off in six weeks. A year and a half later, we had finally read everything. And then two years ago, we published our results in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. So what did we find? Well, obviously, again, spoiler alert, you know the answer. We found that, yes, ExxonMobil did mislead the public. But what we found was also something, in a way, even more interesting. A really systematic discrepancy between what they were saying in private and what they were saying in public. And so we, what we did was we took all these documents and we characterized them. We said, well, what are these documents? And we divided them into four categories. On the most private side were internal memos that were written by and for ExxonMobil executives or by and for ExxonMobil scientists. So these were documents that would only have been read by people inside the company. Then there was a second set of documents which constituted peer-reviewed scientific papers. So these were papers that were published in peer-reviewed journals, so not exactly public, uh, not available to ordinary people, but available to scientists that were co-authored by one or more ExxonMobil employees. Then a third category is what we were calling non-peer-reviewed documents. These were reports or white papers that ExxonMobil wrote. Sometimes they were for oil and gas conferences or for industry. They were designed for industry. Um, they were not peer reviewed, but they were pretty broadly available in the oil and gas industry. And a shareholder could have access to these as well. And then there were advertisements, or what we're calling advertorials. ExxonMobil from 1989 to 2004 every Thursday for all these years took out an advertisement in the New York Times and also sometimes in other newspapers as well, advertisements that were formatted to look like opinion pieces, like op-ed pieces. They were not labeled as advertisements. If you were reading these, you might not have realized that they were in fact paid advertisements, but they were and they expressed the views of the ExxonMobil Corporation. So we have four sets of documents ranging from ones that are completely private to ones that are aimed at the general public and then these other ones that are sort of in between. Then we took every document and we created a timeline from 1976 to 2015. And for every single document we categorized and we said, does this document acknowledge the scientific evidence and agree with it or say that it's basically right? Does it acknowledge the science but maybe raise what we could call reasonable doubts? That is to say, raising legitimate scientific questions like how soon will climate change occur? That's a real scientific question. That's not disinformation. And then there's the doubt mongering where you exaggerate the scientific uncertainties or you deny the science or you reject it altogether. And so for every document, we placed it on this timeline and then we placed it on a spectrum from acknowledging and accepting the science to denying and misrepresenting it. Um, and unfortunately, I have some kind of nice graphics here that my poor postdoc sweated over for a long time, and I can't show you them. But again, I can basically give you the basic idea. And again, I suppose it won't really be a surprise. When we look at the private documents, we find that they are completely aligned with the scientific evidence. They say things like, the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is due to fossil fuel combustion. Increase in carbon dioxide will cause a warming of the Earth's surface. The present trend of fossil fuel consumption will cause dramatic environmental effects before the year 2050. 
So all the things that scientists knew then, and all the things that we all know now, these are all in the private documents that ExxonMobil scientists wrote and that ExxonMobil executives read. On the other hand, if we go to the public documents, the advertisements, the advertorials, then it's the opposite. What we see there is the exaggeration of uncertainty, the claim that we don't really know, that it will be too expensive to fix, that scientists are still arguing. So one example of that then on the other side is an advertorial that said, let's face it, the science of climate change is too uncertain to plan action that could plunge economies into a turmoil. And this became a mantra too, that if we were to act on climate change, it would wreck the economy, cost jobs. Some of you will remember that President George W. Bush used that argument. And then they say, scientists cannot predict with certainty if temperature will increase. Well, that's a flat out lie. Because scientists did predict that temperatures would increase, and they did. So scientists made that prediction, and that prediction has come true. So that's a flat out lie. But most of what's in these advertisements isn't that brutal. It's not that unsubtle. It's a lot more nuanced. It's more like something that's kind of a half-truth or that's sort of misleading. Then they say, for example, we still don't know what role man-made greenhouse gases might play in warming the planet. Well, you know, that's kind of a half-truth. I mean, it is true that if we go back to, say, 1989 or 1995, the exact proportion of the impacts of fossil fuels versus other things like deforestation um, or methane leakage those were not worked out exactly. And even today, there are still questions, for example, about the methane issue. So if by we don't know what role man-made gases might play, you mean exactly what role? Well, OK, maybe. But yes, I mean, we kind of do. We already knew in 1988, Jim Hansen testified in the US Congress that the observed climate single was being driven by greenhouse gases caused by fossil fuel combustion. Scientists knew that in 1988. And in 1995, they affirmed that in the second assessment report of the IPCC, in which they said that most of the observable warming is due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentration from burning of fossil fuels. So we did know that. So the advertisements range from being outright lies to being sort of half-truths and misrepresentations. Well, here's another thing they did in the advertisements, was to push this notion of natural variability. And of course, if you've been following this issue, you know that it's a famous denier or a favorite denier trope to say, oh, it's just natural variability. Well, again, it's a half-truth. Yes, of course, there is natural variability in the climate system. Scientists have known that since the 18th century. But what scientists also know is that we are seeing a change in the uh, climate, a kind of directional change. The natural variability goes like this. But the greenhouse gas driven variability goes like that. And it's that that's really the problem. So yes, there's natural variability. So ExxonMobil says, against this backdrop of largely poorly understood natural variability, it is impossible for scientists to attribute the recent small surface temperature increase to human causes. Well, that's a lie, because that was in 1995. And in fact, scientists had attributed the recent increase in temperature to man-made or human causes. So what we saw was then this very great discrepancy between what they were saying in private and what they were saying in public. And in between, then, as you can imagine, the internal documents that are mostly private, um, sorry, the peer-reviewed articles that are sort of only designed for a select community of scientists, those are pretty close to the internal documents. Those track the science. The non-peer-reviewed documents, so the reports that are written for the oil and gas industry, they're not as egregious as the advertisements, but they're moving in that direction. So in the public face, we see ExxonMobil emphasizing uncertainty, raising doubts, saying we don't really know, we can't really say, we can't predict with certainty. Whereas in their private documents, they're saying, yeah, actually, we do know. <sighs> yeah. So our question was, have climate communications from ExxonMobil misled customers, shareholders, and the public? The answer to that question yes. is yes. Thank you, yes. Of course, the answer to that question is yes. And we know it. And we know it from their own documents. We know that there's a discrepancy between what they said in private and what they said in public. Um, 
And in fact, we can even quantify it. So one thing that Jeffrey did was then, he took all these documents, the over a thousand documents that we had read, and he actually quantified how many of each category acknowledged the science versus how many of each category questioned the science. And what he showed was that in the peer-reviewed science and the private documents, 80% of those documents acknowledged the science, said things that were essentially consistent with what scientists were saying at the time, but the advertisements, exactly the opposite. 80% of those um, focus on the uncertainty or misrepresent the science. So it's almost a mirror image. It's almost as if they took their private knowledge, flipped it upside down, and that's what they presented to the public and to their shareholders. As Jeffrey likes to say, ExxonMobil contributed quietly to the science, privately to the science, but loudly and publicly to raising doubts about it. Just one more example. Um, one of the favorite tricks that they use that we see even being used today by climate change deniers is to take data out of context. So one of the advertisements that ExxonMobil used presented a graph of the variability of temperature in the Sargasso Sea. How many of you know where the Sargasso Sea is? Yeah, okay, about half of you. The other half don't even know where it is, right? I mean, it's not like the Sargasso Sea is exactly the center of planet Earth. But they took this graph that showed that there was all this variability and said, look, it's so variable. You know, it's just so confusing. We just really can't make sense of this. And this was published in the New York Times. The scientist who did that work, who did not work for ExxonMobil, saw it. And he actually issued a public statement saying that their use of his work was, quote, very misleading. OK, so. Just one more quotation, again, in hindsight, one of the scientists who worked for ExxonMobil or worked with ExxonMobil scientists in the 70s was interviewed in 2018, <clears throat> and here's how he put it, quote, even though we were writing all these papers with Exxon scientists, which were basically supporting the idea that climate change from CO2 emissions was going to change the climate of the Earth, according to our best scientific understanding, the front office of the company was supporting people that we call climate change deniers. They were giving millions of dollars to other entities to support the idea that CO2 greenhouse effect was a hoax. Oh, a hoax, where have we heard that before? Lock them up! I didn't say that. <laughs> So that's the basic story of what Jeffrey and I have worked on. But of course, there's more. And there's more that connects with the work that I did in Merchants of Doubt. Um, and it has to do with the way ExxonMobil also worked with what they called third-party allies. And this is a straight out of the tobacco playbook. It's one of the things we wrote about in our book, that one of the things the tobacco industry realized early on was that if a tobacco executive got up in public and said, well, you know, we don't really know if smoking is bad, most of us wouldn't find that credible. But if a scientist said it, or some group that appeared to be independent, then we might listen. And then journalists might quote them in newspaper articles or on the radio. And so the tobacco industry developed the strategy of giving a lot of money to organizations that appeared to be independent, but in fact were not. And we know now that ExxonMobil has done the same thing. So a few years ago, the Royal Society in Britain, one of the world's oldest scientific societies, not exactly a radical left wing organization, actually wrote a letter to ExxonMobil asking them to cease and desist funding climate change disinformation organizations. They came up with a list based on ExxonMobil's own tax returns that showed who they had given money to, and that list included over 37 think tanks, including ones that are probably familiar to many of you, like the Heartland Institute. Yeah, those people give the Heartland a bad name. I think you should sue them for defamation. <laughs> we also know that they've given money to individual scientists, individual um, contrarian scientists or outlier scientists, so one of them, I'm sad to say, is someone who has worked at Harvard, a man by the name of Willie Soon. You may have read about him. For decades, Willie Soon, who works at the Harvard-Smithsonian um, Observatory, although I think he's not actually there anymore, 
But for decades, he published scientific papers saying that climate change was not caused by greenhouse gas emissions. It was caused by solar variability. We now know that he was given $1.25 million from the fossil fuel industry. Yeah, nice guy. And of course, this, is very, this isn't just damaging to the public understanding of science. It's also damaging to science, because now it gives the impression that scientists are just all corrupt and can be bought for a million dollars, which I want to say, I think most of us would definitely want at least two million. But <laughs> Maybe three. Uh, and then, of course, there's the problem of the climate-denying politicians. And I think it doesn't take, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see the connections here between what ExxonMobil did, the talking points that they developed about uncertainty, the talking points they developed about losing jobs, the talking points that they developed about a hoax. And so one document we found from the Global Climate Coalition, which was a denier group that ExxonMobil was part of, um, after the rejection of the Kyoto Protocol, which they worked hard to achieve, um, they wrote a document in which they thanked their members and they said, quote, POTUS, that is to say the President of the United States, rejected Kyoto in part based on input from you. So we know that they have influenced politics in this country from top to bottom, right up to the President of the United States. And we also know that they've influenced politics on the state and local level as well. So this has been very damaging both to the public understanding of science and to the political process that we need to move this issue forward. Um, I have a nice photograph here of our dear friend, Senator James Inhofe, carrying a snowball. Um, I like to call him Senator Snowball. It's my affectionate term from him. And of course, he was the one who really promoted the idea, as he put it, quote, the idea that man-made gases CO2 are causing catastrophic global warming is the greatest hoax ever perpetuated on the American people. Um, I have a funny personal story about this. On the 1st of April a few years ago, I got a phone call from a reporter at the Tulsa Register, and he said to me, are you aware of the fact that Senator James Inhofe has attacked you on the floor of the US Senate? And I, I like, held my phone like this, and I thought, is this an April Fool's joke? You know? <laughs> Um, but unfortunately, it was no joke. And as we know, for a long time now, uh, the leadership of one of our two political parties has refused to accept that this is a real problem. And that denial of the problem makes it impossible for us to have the appropriate conversation that we should be having about what the solution to this problem is, the role that renewable energy can play, not just in fixing climate change, but boosting the economies of every state in this union. Because you know what? Not every state has oil and gas. And not every state has coal, but every state has wind and sun, and every state can have batteries. So we know that this problem is solvable, and that's the third way in which ExxonMobil has obstructed this issue and caused confusion, because they have all also promoted the idea that we can't really solve this problem. They've promoted the idea that it's too difficult and we just have to keep on using oil and gas even if maybe it's not that great. So, and they've argued that renewables aren't reliable, that the sun is too, doesn't shine all the time, that wind is too intermittent, you know, and therefore we have to keep using oil and gas. And this is the big lie we face today. Because we know now that the majority of American people, despite every effort of ExxonMobil, this is a David and Goliath story. ExxonMobil is huge. They have spent, we know, at least hundreds of millions of dollars and maybe billions on disinformation, on misinformation, and on outright lies. We know they have spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, on lobbying Congress to prevent sensible policies about climate change. We know they spent huge amounts of money to block the Waxman-Markey bill that would have given us emissions trading system. And we know that emissions trading worked for acid rain, and it could have worked for climate change, but we know that they have stood in the way. And now they stand in the way again today, because they keep telling us, they keep telling the American people, you know, that wind is for sissies, right? That solar is for hippies. But we want to say, no, solar is for everyone, right? <laughs> And wind 
is for everyone. And storage is for everyone. And these are forms of power that everyone can use, but that's what ExxonMobil doesn't want. They don't want a distributed energy system that is democratic. They want a system that they can continue to control, and by controlling that system, control our politics as well. So we have to break through that logjam, and we will. We have exposed so much of what ExxonMobil has done, and it hasn't been easy, and they say really nasty things about me on the internet. And I have to say, I find it kind of amazing, because sometimes I think, wow, are they actually scared of me? You know, <laughs> because I'm not really anywhere near really. I mean, I'm just a professor, right? to all of you here today. Um, you may feel like you're not anybody, that how could you possibly take on ExxonMobil? But you know what? 15 years ago, I wasn't anybody. Nobody had heard of me. I'd written some academic books that, you know, I mean, I was respected, but, you know, nobody knew who I was. Nobody stopped me in the street and said, I know who you are, right? But then we just started doing this work. And we started digging, and we started reading, and we learned things, and we started talking about what we had learned. And so, Every single one of you here can do that. And so that's my ask to you, because it also gets kind of tiring doing all this work. And you know, I'm getting a little old because I was born in 1958. Um, <laughs> and because this is a relay race and I want to be able to pass the baton. So all of you and your family and your children and your neighbors, we all have to be engaged in this. And the big fight now is the fight to convince the American people that renewable energy is not for sissies, that this is the future, this is the clean, green, prosperous future that we need, that we want, and that we deserve. And there's no reason why we shouldn't have it, and there's no reason why we won't have it. So thank you all so much for being here today. Please have a seat, that was wonderful. Um, we appreciate the love and honor that you are giving uh, Professor Oreskes. And uh, we have a way to do that also for people that have dedicated their life to supporting um, ideas and concepts and efforts aligned with our mission. And, uh, and Naomi has surely done that. And so uh, for the last 20 years, we planted trees in the honor of these exception, uh, exceptional people. And we have a tree right here uh, from this family of Rescues. Um, and, uh, and she has agreed to take a few questions. I'm going to tell you a really short story beforehand. Is who was here for the Bethany McLean uh, keynote yesterday? And uh, she uh, is an uh, investment analyst and uh, predicted the downfall of Enron and speaks at uh, financial conferences all over the country. And you know, this is a public audience and I assured her that uh, you guys were wonderful and we could take questions. And we took questions and I was walking her out and she was like, those are better questions than I get at investment conferences. <laughs> So, so I say that because we're about to do questions again, so keep it up, okay? <laughs> All right, so if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll, and I'll come out. And I just want to add to that too, my new book that's coming out in the fall, Why Trust Science, is actually based on a question I got at a talk. Someone who was like a little hostile got up in the back of the room and went like this and said, well, why should we trust science? I was like, yeah, good question. I'll write a book about it. So <laughs> you could be the one to inspire my next book. So. OK, so will you take your, OK, great. Thank you for your leadership and for making science accessible to us. Thank you. You're welcome. So I've taken on helping the wonderful Rotarians of the world understand and act on climate change. And the April issue in the US was dedicated to helping Rotarians begin to think about climate change. 
those who are humanitarians and get climate change see it as a humanitarian crisis. What do you say to the Rotarians who perhaps have made their money in gas and oil or steel or cement or cars and are threatened and therefore they say, well, we don't do political things, climate change is political. Yeah. How can we help them be humanitarians in climate change as well as the rest of their lives? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for doing work with the Rotarians. I think that's so important to be reaching out to communities that might not otherwise be engaged on this issue. You know, my experience is it's hard to generalize because every community is different. But certainly one thing that I think you can say to people that I've said, oil and gas were great in their day. You know, there's a reason we built an economy based on fossil fuels. They're incredibly efficient. They're incredibly um, effective. You know, they're really good to power cars and airplanes and warmer houses, and those were all good things. And the people who first developed the oil and gas industry, we're not saying that those people were necessarily bad people. I mean, some of them were, but you know. I mean, but the point is, you know, we're not saying that they were evil people because they did this thing. They didn't know in 1900 or 1920 or 1940 or even 1953 that what they were going to do was going to create this terrible problem that is in fact hurting people around the globe, hurting farmers, hurting workers, hurting children, um, damaging livestock, damaging crops. They didn't know. So okay, you know, we all, things happen. Nobody can be blamed for something they didn't know. But now we do know. And all of the predictions that these scientists made back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, those predictions have now all come true. And now that we know, we can't really, we can't pretend not to know, and we don't really have an excuse. And that's why the time has come now to shift and to say, fossil fuels have had a good run, and we're grateful for what we got from them, but now it's time to move into the energy systems of the 21st century, and there will be terrific economic opportunities to be in that. And that's the other thing I didn't say, um, which I would have said if my slides hadn't been messed up. The other big myth that the fossil fuel industry perpetuates and lots of educated people have bought into this, and it is a myth. It's the myth that solar and wind, that renewable energy is too expensive. That might have been true 40 years ago. It is no longer true now. We have seen a sea change in the price of renewables in the last 10 years. Wind and solar are now cheaper. They are cheap, way cheaper than nuclear, much cheaper than coal, cheaper than oil, and even cheaper than gas. It is actually the economically sensible way to go at this point. So even if you don't care about climate change, even if you don't care that people are dying in Bangladesh or the farmers are being destroyed here in the United States, I wouldn't actually say that, but you know what I mean. I mean, even if those issues don't move you, just on a purely pragmatic economic basis, this is the future. And it's also good in so many other ways, like public health. I mean, coal has huge negative public health effects. So there are so many reasons why this is the right thing to do. And if climate change doesn't move you, then you know maybe one of these other reasons does. Hello. Uh, thanks for your, your talk today. Um, what do you think about ExxonMobil now saying, kind of putting out there that they're, the, they're leading the way now in renewable energy and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> just to answer your question, I mean, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? I mean, it's just not credible, right? These people have a 50-year history of dishonesty. So, you know, actions speak louder than words. If they actually were to announce to their shareholders, and I don't mean just blather in the New York Times, I mean announcing at a shareholders meeting a plan to phase out oil and gas production, beginning with a complete elimination of exploration for new oil and gas, starting this year, then, yes, then there'd be something to talk about. But they can say that they're leading these other things. They can say they support a carbon tax. They can say they believe that climate change is real. But you look at their annual reports, they are still investing in new exploration for new oil and gas fields. And I began my life as an exploration geologist, so I know something about this. Yes, I've had an interesting life trajectory. When you start the grassroots Expiration, you're talking about oil and gas that you might be pumping out of the ground 30, 40, 50 years from now. So that is simply not consistent with claiming that you understand climate change.
Thank you. Good afternoon. That one over here. I'm uh, from Minnesota and I'm a member of the solar industry there. And I, in my business background, I know from experience that advertising, even though it could be literally true, if misleading, is illegal in, in the whole nation. And I am just can't understand why the solar industry hasn't, other than maybe their lawyers are better paid than the solar industry's lawyers, why we can't successfully win that kind of court battle that they've, they've significantly damaged the solar industry, not to speak of the whole planet. Yeah, well, I think that is a brilliant idea, and you just said you live in Minnesota, so I think you should try to get an appointment with the state attorney general's office and bring that idea, because Minnesota, as you may know, led the United States in the fight against the tobacco industry. And, so what? I mean, Minnesota, the attorney general's office in Minnesota, those people were heroes. They are big unsung heroes. I mean, people in public health know about what they did. So there's an opportunity now. And, and the idea that the solar industry has been damaged, I think, is a very clever one. Because if you want to bring a court case, if you want to bring a civil case, you have to be able to show that someone was harmed, right? And so in the tobacco story, you know, a big part of the tobacco story was the scientific evidence of the harms of tobacco use. But the idea that the solar industry has been economically harmed by this is very, I think, very interesting one. Um, so I would really encourage you, if you could get a, a meeting, you know, if, I mean, you may not be able to get the Attorney General to listen to you right away, but you might be able to get one of the staff members. And we know that in New York and Massachusetts and a number of other states, people have been looking closely at this question of what the legal remedies could be. And, you know, one of the great lessons of the tobacco story was that you know, law is a very complicated and funny thing. I'm not a lawyer, but um, when Sharon Eubanks, who was at the Department of Justice, had the idea that the Department of Justice could sue the tobacco industry, prosecute the tobacco industry under the RICO statutes, which had originally been developed to fight organized crime, most people thought that she had completely gone off the deep end, right? And she, she had a very, very great uphill battle in the Department of Justice. She has a great book she's written called Bad Actors that you might want to get and read. So most people thought using the RICO statutes was a ridiculous stretch, and yet it worked. And it turned out to be really a turning point in the public health fight against the tobacco industry. So there are legal remedies out there. We may not yet know what they are, but this is why it's super important to talk to the local attorney generals, to talk to friends who might be lawyers, to think about who you know who might be able to be creative and come up with ideas. Because I think, you know, the most, one of the most important lessons of the 20th century is that Al Capone went to jail for tax evasion. Yeah, maybe there's room. Um, I think I should probably, do we want to, there was someone on a bicycle here with a question. I, I feel like, oh, if, one, I feel like we have to take a question again. from the bicycle. Um, can you hear me? Uh, for, first, thank you so much for the work you do. I mean, we all know science is fake, but other than that, now I'm an engineer, it's a joke. Joke, bad joke. Um, two, two things. One, the person who raised a question about economic value and people in oil and gas, he raised a lot of valid points about how the economics are for getting off of carbon, going to renewables. Uh, so, I'm not ashamed. Um, the benefits of human power, thank all of you. But, uh, um, so it's a valid point, but if you live somewhere, I'm from Kentucky, if you live somewhere where your job is based on coal, until those renewable energy jobs come into your town, it's gonna be a tough sell. Once people come in, and that's where federal help could help. Could help. But anyway, it's tough when you have to move your family somewhere. Um, the other thing is, did Shell recently announce that they're accepting the science of global warming? I thought I heard somewhere that they made some statement. Should I, if I, not that I would, but if I had to buy cash, should I go to, to Shell? Because I'll never go to, go to Exxon. Yeah. Well, I don't want to be giving investment advice, you know, but I don't think that any of us should be investing in any oil, gas company or coal, any fossil fuel company until, as I just said, it's not enough just to say you accept the science. I mean, I was at a big meeting with a vice president of BP a couple years ago, and he's a good guy, you know, he's not a horrible person, and he said a lot of things that I agreed with, 
But then he said, the future is renewables and gas. And I, I get it why if I were VP of B, BP, VP of BP, I might want to think that. But it's just not right. It's not right that we are still exploring for more gas. Gas is a fossil fuel. It's not clean. It's not green. Yes, obviously, we're not going to stop using gas tomorrow. But we should not be exploring for more new gas fields. We should not be developing more new gas fields. So until the day that BP announces that it's only going with renewables, maybe carbon storage, maybe investing in batteries, I mean, there's a lot of great things these companies could do. And I get it that no big company is going to change their business model overnight. But on the other hand, these guys have stalled for 30 years. And the fact that they've got them backs, their backs up against a wall now is not our fault. So I just think there's lots of great things to invest in. I've, I'm personally in the process of divesting my own pension fund holdings. Um, I've been working with the Divest Harvard students. Um, we can do it. It's another uphill battle. But we don't need ExxonMobil in our portfolios. And we frankly don't need oil and gas. And if Harvard had divested from coal three years ago when the students had asked them to, our endowment would actually be doing better because coal stocks have collapsed. So you know, the idea that you have to invest in fossil fuels to have a strong portfolio, I, I don't think that's true. And I mean, you've heard from other people about that who know more than me. So anyway, I think that's a good place to end. Thank you all so much for being here. Really, it's been a great audience.